Good morning and God bless you. We're delighted to have you with us here this morning. Perhaps this is your first time joining us. We extend a warm welcome to you and trust that you're blessed with what you hear today. We want to begin with prayer. We want to continue to pray for our president and our nation. We also want to continue to pray for our local community. And we want to continue to pray for Cornerstone Pentecostal Church and members in particular. Perhaps you have a special unspoken request. This is a perfect time to make that known unto God. Let's pray together now. Father, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your presence. Father, we pray for our president and our nation. We pray that you keep your hands upon this president and involved in the actions, thoughts, and policies of this nation. God, we ask that. Father, we also pray for our local community that you would open up doors of utterance that we can continue to reach and to make contact with people in this community. And Father, we pray for Cornerstone Pentecostal Church that you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out your presence, your protection, and your provision upon your people. We ask all of this in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, and everybody said amen. I want to take us back to where we were yesterday in James chapter number five. We started uh, in verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So today we're gonna to talk about the church as a healing community part two. The church as a healing community part two. Yesterday we talked about the calling of the elders of the church and anointing them with oil. And it's a, it's a not just a restoration of, of relationships or getting in alignment with relationship. And in this case, the elders of the church, once again, making contact. But it's also, the Bible adds this interesting phrase, and if they have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven them. Interesting that that phraseology appears to almost seem as a theme through uh, these continuing scriptures about sin. Yesterday, we also noted in that particular uh, verse of scripture that we believe that what, what is happening here is a person that is sick has reevaluated why they're sick and their relationship with Jesus Christ. And here it's bringing them to realign with the elders of the church, receiving prayer, receiving oil upon their heads, the prayer of faith, and God bringing that alignment back together, not just with the elders, but that relationship with God himself. And if they have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven. But I want to read the following scriptures and comment on them today, beginning in verse number 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Now our context here is the church as a healing community. We started out, as we've already mentioned, that it's first going to the elders of the church and then there is, there is healing and then there is forgiveness. And now we're talking about confessing faults one to another and praying one for another that we may be healed. So we're still talking about healing and we're still in the context of the church. Interestingly, this word faults literally means sins, mistakes, um, a lack of moral judgment, a slipping off of the path of righteousness. Interestingly, it is the same word that is used in the book of Galatians chapter number six, when it says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, meaning that somebody is overwhelmed or overtaken by sin, 
and they fall and fail. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In our passage here in James, it's saying to pray one for another that ye may be healed. Perhaps there's somebody that's watching here this morning that is suffering in isolation because you're dealing with a situation, a problem that's perhaps reoccurring, a particular sin that comes around every once in a while, and you've not yet been able to build a strength there. There's a spot of weakness. There's a, a breach in your wall. Finding people that are trusted in the church, even if it's the same elders that you came to, seeking physical healing and anointing on your head and a prayer of faith. Perhaps there's something that needs to be confessed, not necessarily because we're following some Catholic tradition that we have to confess our sins to a priest. We believe that that's false doctrine. But you're needing prayer help. You're needing strength. You're needing somebody to join with you. You know, the Bible says that one can put a thousand to flight, but two exponentially because their strength with brethren. And the Bible says that there may be healing. This is a form of healing that needs to take place while we are interacting horizontally. I'm not saying or suggesting that we could, should confess or tell everybody everything that we are experiencing or everywhere that we have failed. I believe there needs to be greater, uh, greater wisdom employed here. You need to find brethren that are trusted. In fact, the Bible continues by qualifying this. Listen carefully. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In every church, and specifically this church here at Cornerstone, there are brethren among us that can be trusted, that have a le level of integrity and a walk with God that can be trusted. Most notably, some things that are told in confidence, hey brother, would you pray, for, pray with me on this? I'm struggling in an area. This is vital to the body of Christ. When this is not available, to a local church. It makes a church shallow and makes a church wounded. When you have an accumulation of wounds that are never healed or situations where people are not truly overcoming or truly gaining the victory in private areas of their lives because they just don't feel like there's anybody there they can trust. The church takes on a different hue. It no longer becomes the place where the bomb of Gilead is available to all of us. It's no longer a place where all of us are, have a common denominator at the foot of the cross and all of us have equal representation in the kingdom of God. But it puts a, it puts a human mechanism into a local congregation to where people are living one way at church and another way at home only because they don't feel that they can be real and honest. The church is designed to be a healing community. Yes, salvation is the utmost responsibility of the church. And our relationship with God, which is vertical, is the preeminent responsibility of the church of the living God. But after our relationship with God is solidified, it has to be expressed horizontally. And that, first of all, before it's the outside world, first has to take effect within the four walls of the church. There is a place where you can go with those issues. There are people that will pray with you. The church is designed to be a healing community. Finally, I'd also like to make note of the fact that once people truly are delivered and find wholeness within the context of the body of Christ, 
it becomes a place that broadens their testimony, enlarges their witness, and now can fully express to a lost and a dying world that the church indeed is the place for everybody. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow for part three of the church as a healing community. God bless you.